Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 16th of August and quite a lot of updates this week. As always, I have the chapters, so you can jump to the update you care about the most. Did a whole bunch of new videos this week. Uh, the first one was, what do I do? And what are the considerations if I don't want to or cannot use the regional pairings? So I go through some of the implications around that. Then I did a video on GitHub Copilot, and I think some of the biggest things you would focus on in your first hour of using it to get the most productivity gains. And then I did a video on Azure Arc Jumpstart, a phenomenal resource to help learn, experiment, try out the different capabilities. And then I actually created another channel for non-technical things and answered the question that keeps coming up, how do I learn and improve? So I created a very short video on that, but answering it, maybe not in the way uh, you would expect. So on to what's new on the compute side. So the Azure Kubernetes Service VS Code extension has had some updates. This is really around the ability to add an Azure Container Registry to your cluster. I can generate Kubernetes deployment files, I can generate Docker files, and I can even generate GitHub Actions all now within that AKS extension, which you can just go and get from the marketplace, make sure you're running the newest version. Azure CNI Overlay now has dual stack capability on Windows nodes. Remember, CNI Overlay is the newer networking add-on for AKS that gives you a different IP space for the pods than the nodes, but it removes a lot of the restrictions we had with KubeNet. So now with dual stack, I can have both IPv4 and IPv6. And really following on from that, if I'm having the Azure CNI overlay with um, CNI Cilium, for Linux, that also now has the dual stack support. So that's gonna give me the control plane of the Azure CNI overlay, but the data plane of Cilium, which will give you the very high performance networking, great observability, great security. And now, hey, I get that IPv4 and the IPv6. An AKS, the FIPS 140-2 enabled node pools now have mutability, which means I can enable or disable it. Now, when I change that, it will do a re-image of the node pool. And of course, the FIPS 140-2 is that government standard that defines these minimum security requirements for the cryptographic modules. So I can now change an existing node pool based on my requirements. On the networking side, so App Gateway now has the option to have a dedicated log analytic analytics table. And actually it could be multiple tables depending on which specific diagnostic settings you enable, but now it will go to those specific categories of tables instead of going to the Azure Diagnostics table. So if I want that granularity, if I want to split that out, I can now do that. On the storage side, so Azure NetApp Files now has double encryption at rest in GA. So it's multiple independent encryption layers. So this helps give me additional protection beyond what I might get with a single encryption layer. So I could think about, well, what if an encryption key was compromised? What if there was a misconfiguration? What if there was a, some kind of bug or something in a cryptographic capability? Well, now I've got these dual sets and I set it when I create the capacity pool and I can use my own encryption keys. And it's got very minimal performance impact on that. And also now the minimum volume size is 50 gig gigabytes. This is down from an initial 100 gigabyte minimum. It just enables me to get started with a lower amount of storage and therefore a lower amount of cost. On the database side, so dev container templates are now available for Azure SQL database. So think of this as providing a really easy way to get my development environment up and running to work with Azure SQL Database. And it's got all of the tools, all of the dependencies pre-configured for .NET Aspire, .NET 8, Node.js, Python. Within VS Code, I would just go and say, hey, I need to add a dev container configuration template. I'll select the one I want based on the language I'm using. And now I can go ahead and start developing in that VS Code with all of those components I need to develop against Azure SQL Database, just all there and all of the tooling I require. 
MySQL Flexible now has managed HSM support in GA. So if I need that additional FIPS 140-2 level three, maybe if I need that single tenant uh, key vault solution, I can now store my customer managed keys in a managed HSM instance that I use for the encryption of my particular MySQL Flexible instance. Azure SQL Hyperscale now has separate maintenance windows for the named replicas. So I can have up to 30 of these named replicas, which can be really useful if I just need read access and I don't want to place the burden on that primary replica. Well, now for those named replicas, I can have separate maintenance windows from whatever the default is. So I can control what is the impact to the applications that are reading from that named replica um, within my configuration. I can also optionally turn on the advanced notices. So 24 hours before, I'll get a notification as well. Cosmos DB has updates in its data explorer. It's really just about, it's a brand new and improved resource tree. So this is the directory structure that would show me my databases, my containers, all the other resources. It's just more user-friendly, more convenient. And PostgreSQL Flexible now has its Azure policy capabilities in GA. So we can go and look. So remember, Azure policy is fantastic because it can help me track compliance if I'm just in an audit mode, but I can also enforce things. So now if I go and look, I can say things like, hey, I have to have an entry administrator. I have to have auditing enabled. I need connection throttling. I need uh, diagnostic settings because I want to now go and track certain things that are happening, enforce SSL connections. There's a whole bunch of different things that I can do. And it shows me, hey, is this just audit or can I audit and deny? I can audit if not exists, et cetera, et cetera. So if I am using uh, Postgres SQL Flexible, now I can use that standard Azure policy as part of my governance to track compliance or maybe even enforce my requirements. Postgres SQL Flexible also now has Terraform support for a Geo Restore. So I'm using Terraform for my infrastructure as code. Now I can also do a geo restore as part of that infrastructure as code. So as part of my DevOps pipelines, my CI CD, I can leverage that geo restore as part of standing up uh, some other environment. Azure Cache for Redis now can enforce intra authentication. Now this is for the basic standard and premium tiers. So now I have to use intra integrated authentication. So I'm going to use a service principle. Uh, ideally, I use a managed identity. It's for an Azure resource, and it won't allow me to use access key-based authentication. So it's going to enhance my security by enabling that option. And then Container Insights now has a high scale mode in preview. Remember, Container Insights provides this curated set of metrics and logs around my AKS environment. So what high scale does is for the collection of that container console, so standard out, standard error, when I turn on the high throughput, it will let me collect up to 50,000 logs per second per node. There's some changes made behind the scenes. I think there's a change to the config map, then I go and turn this on. But realize I do need my AKS nodes to be a bit beefier. I think they recommend 16 CPU cores as a minimum if I'm gonna go and turn that on. And then miscellaneous. So Chaos Studio now has a new virtual machine network isolation fault. So Chaos Studio lets me craft experiments where I define types of failures I want to simulate, but it's simulating it by actually making that effect happen to the target resources. So be careful where you use this. But now for the VM network isolation, for the targeted VMs, it will drop all the inbound and outbound packets for whatever duration I configure for that experiment. Now, I can't cancel the experiment once it starts because it's using the agent that runs inside the guest Windows or Linux. Well, if it's now dropping all network packets, if I try and send a cancellation, well, that, that inbound packet will get dropped. So once you start, you're not finishing. Um, for Linux, it's outbound only. It's dropping the packets for. Don't forget to turn on MFA in your tenant and for the people that use the Azure portal, the Entra Admin Center and the Intune Admin Center, because 15th of October, you have to use MFA to access those things. I mean, there is a postpone option if you need it, you can apply for a postponement, 
but really you want to be using strong authentication. So I'm MFA, I'm using passwordless, I'm using pass keys. You want to be using those things anyway. Cross region restore for SQL and HANA database backups are now supported with private endpoints enabled. So what I would go and do is I would set up private endpoints now to the other region and be able to do that cross region restore to the secondary region. And finally, Azure deployment environments now have private registry support. So an Azure de development environment lets me enable my developers via the developer portal to quickly go and spin up the application infrastructure I require. Think of those Azure resources. So your developer administrators go and craft these templates with the sets of resources I want for these types of templates and the resources within them. Well, now as part of that, I can reference a private Azure Container Registry that have the, the hosting, the reference of my container images. It's gonna help me enhance my security for both sensitive data, for my proprietary code, maybe meet compliance requirements, even minimize latency, because it, I can specify, hey, where this is in relation to that environment. And that was it. Uh, as always, I hope that was useful. And until next video, take care.